Hey everybody, this is James, again joined by uh, Glenn. Glenn with uh, Crimson Lotus Tea. Yeah, so this episode we will be drinking some tea, but we're actually going to be focusing a little bit more on a few different topics, uh, questions that um, I have right here. Um, so yeah, why don't we uh, hop right in? So uh, one conversation we've had over the years um, is about tea aging in Seattle, and I think I remember even back in twenty. 20- 14 or 2015, uh, you had done, crunched a bunch of climate data in yeah. Seattle and had done a blog post. This is before yeah. you'd even sourced tea from Yunnan. Yeah. Um, and uh, when you did come back from Yunnan that year, I remember that one of the teas that Denny, Lamu, yourself, and I had was the Slumbering Dragon uh, in 2015. And we had that same tea last year, yeah. if I recall correctly. And it was dramatically different much um, different yeah. yeah a lot less uh in your face bitter but still quite potent yeah um so i guess uh sort of to kick off that conversation it's like how do you think that tea has been aging and uh, do you find that a lot of your teas have been aging sort of like in a similar trajectory uh like i know that some people will talk about like certain vendors in taiwan uh have sort of like a house taste yeah of like and maybe it's just because they tend to select certain material or because it uh, is aged in sort of the same environment. So, I don't know. That's a lot. Uh, yeah, no, that's an interesting yeah. – it's, it's an interesting take on, on some of those things. And Slumbering Dragon I think is maybe maybe a little bit of an outlier. I mean uh-huh. it, it, it was it – was, it's such an aggressive tea young. And uh, I've got other aggressive teas that haven't changed. But Slumbering Dragon does. I mean it definitely – it definitely mellows, um, which is nice. Um, I, I remember that blog post and, you know, I put as much information as I had into the blog post. Um, but now like I find out like, um, like I think if you, if you had like, like a Seattle natural storage and you, you like didn't have windows in your house, I think it would work out much differently because, um, what I have right now is I've got a modified storage so like i control the temperature and humidity so i guess it i it probably qualifies as like a seattle modified storage um but if i didn't do that um oh, i mean the house would definitely be way too dry in the winter time um and i don't think it would do good but if you um so this last year um just a couple months ago we had like the huge like snowstorm here in seattle and um i like to try to follow a lot like the the, the cliff mass blog oh yeah yeah Me and too. um yeah. he he crunched the numbers and for like a three-week period the city of Seattle was the driest city in the nation. And that's like when you're drier than, you know, like, you know, California cities and stuff, that's, um, that's significantly, significantly dry. Um, so I don't know. I haven't, um, like it would be, it would be a really good experiment to do like just a, a straight Seattle natural storage. But for, for most of our product, I think it'd be too much of a risk to just really just leave it entirely to chance. So we work with kind of a Seattle modified storage. So we sit around, Usually around like uh, the high high sixties, relative humidity, and about the same for uh, about the same for temperature, and I'm not sure where that matches with uh, uh, I mean, because I know Guangzhou is much much uh, much more humid than that and right. stuff, and um, Kunming is actually more humid than people really realize. Kunming is I I know it technically, well it, it comes down to like definitions of, of of humidity. Some people say that like wet storage is any storage where it makes mold and dry storage is any storage where it doesn't make mold. So that's a, a definition of it and stuff. So I, I don't know, but, um, uh, I think Kunming is probably wetter than people think and Seattle's probably drier than people think. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think I, I agree with that. I think a lot of that probably has to do with, uh, because some of the early trendsetters, like specifically Hong Kong and yeah. to a lesser extent, Taiwan, yeah. uh, were, uh, are pretty humid and pretty hot. And so yeah. when you set the, norms towards that standards then stuff like kunming will look pretty dry in comparison right well even i mean even inside of hong kong you've got so you've got like the traditional you know from what i can tell in the research i've done you've got the traditional like old style um i mean the people who were buying it were restaurants right i mean they they, yeah. they wanted to have it and all in you know most of the restaurants um you know in in hong kong are down by the waterfront they're storing tea almost under sea level right you know so they're storing it in like the basement of some restaurant it's just 
thick and dank and super humid, but you can store, you could have like a, a warehouse in Hong Kong that was on the, you know, 15th story of right. some like sky rise. And that's going to be dramatically different. Or you could have it up in the, up in the mountains as you're like driving out into the, the hills there. And that's going to be a dramatically different experience than like the, the right. restaurant store. Pool yeah. And I think that captures something that people don't think about very much is that uh, the methodology and how it's stored matters quite a lot because yeah. Hong Kong, of course, famous for its traditionally stored yeah. restaurant tea or whatever, um, stored in like low elevation near the ocean uh, where it's more humid um, and still quite hot, uh, yeah. but also very famous for um, dry storage of like things like the 88 QB, uh, which was stored in, like as you said, yeah. in an apartment building or yeah. an office building, uh, just higher up where it's less exposed to that dank humidity that yeah. you would get. Um, yeah, it's so, it's so malleable, like all the different uh, results and things that you can get. It's really hard to just sit down and say, this is this. Mm -hmm. So do you find that your tea is aging, I guess, minus the slumbering jargon, if that one is aging a little differently? Uh, like, has it, uh, has most of the tea changed at least? Um, I, they definitely, they definitely have, and some are changing, changing faster than others. Um, but I think it's, um, I mean, realistically it's only been like five years. Right. And I remember, you know, when we first started, I was thinking, oh man, if I could just taste my teas in five years. And a lot of them really are still pretty, pretty similar. Um, I think, I think some of the, you know, you know, you know traditional human stored stuff, um, ages things much, 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 much quicker. Right. And I, I, I really don't want to risk mold damaging you know what is you know like a financial investment for my company and i also have tried to um kind of balance the line between not imposing my thoughts of humidity on what the customer is going to get trying to just kind of keep the tea in a nice like simple baseline and then if a customer buys our tea and they want to like super dry store it, if they want a super humid store it, i mean that's they, they they can do that but um yeah um so I'm guessing that <clears throat> under most definitions, you would probably call your tea dry stored, at least. Dry stored, if okay. the definition of wet storage is it makes mold, so because ours, mm -hmm. ours doesn't. So it's definitely it's definitely dry, drier. And how how about compared to I don't know like your average Kunming storage? Would you say it's like you know slower, faster? Or? I think it's probably a little slower than our than, okay. than your average average Kunming storage. But e even then, you know, like so like our our storage facility in Kunming is closer to the lakes, so it's a little bit more humid than some of the markets, which are a little further from the lakes. Um, so I think our Kunming storage is probably a little wetter than most uh, most Kunming storage. Um, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I would, I think for my own tea, speaking of just about my own too, is it'd be certainly qualified as dry storage and like uh, at like at wettest, it would be around Kunming level. It's right. Certainly not anywhere close to right. elsewhere, uh, like Guangzhou or, or Taiwan or anything What's like that. What's your humidifier set to? What do you, uh, uh what humidity? You, you Kumador, yeah. yeah. I've been sort of setting it to the mid sixties or so. Okay. Um, and, uh, during the, most of the year, it's probably around the mid sixties temperature wise too. And then, nice. uh, it rises, uh, during the summer. I'd imagine you don't, uh, you don't decrease the temperature in the heat of summer. Do you? No, basically I, well, I've got a, I've got a, a heater in winter that just kind of like cycles and keeps okay. it right around 70. And then I just basically turn it off the entire summer and everything just, the room just kind of always stays that way. And one of the nice things is the more, the more you have in storage, like the less work you actually have to do. Um, it kind of creates like a collective right. mass of calmness. So in some sense, being a vendor makes it easier to store for than your average hobbyist. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, if you if you can fill an entire warehouse, I mean, we don't have an entire warehouse, but if you could fill like an entire warehouse floor to ceiling with like thousands and thousands and thousands of kilos of puer, it's, it's so happy. So th there's your recommendation: <laughs> just become a tea vendor, and your tea will age great. Uh, okay. Um, so let's see. In 2018, uh, as the case is with other years. You brought on some older blends as well as some newer ones. Um, so when selecting material and choosing what to blend, uh, how much are you thinking about and prioritizing material you like now versus like thinking about it, like, you know, how will this taste in after some period of time, whether it's yeah. a year, five years, whatever. Um, so I think most people and vendors would like to say uh, you're focusing on both. 
uh, to some extent, but like I'd imagine it at least to some extent is a balancing act of thinking yeah. about sort of like the trajectory versus yeah. like the now. So, uh, so yeah, every year I, I try to experiment more with blending and I've, I've never, I've never been of the mindset that you should buy my teas and not enjoy them. Right. You buy my teas and then in 20 years they are going to be amazing. Like I, I think that, I think that even young poor are at least to have, have some beneficial experience when, when it's young. Um, that's, that's my, my thoughts on that. And, um, as far as like like blending for aging, um, I you know I have discussions with people in Kuming, uh, in Kuming and you not who are who are good at that people who have a track record of that, um, but you know I've only got a handful of uh, years of of blends, so I'm happy with where they are now, and I and I have have hopes that they're going to be awesome at different stages, but I really um, I I really don't know. Um, and I, I've, I've worked with some people who are so good about knowing, I mean, just, just through like the amount of years that they've had, I mean, if they've been working for 40 years in the Puar industry, like just, just, just by domain knowledge, they know what things have done just because they've seen them, um, and working with them and trying figuring out like, you know, like they know that like, okay, well, you know, Jing Mai is really nice for the first like 10 or 15 years and then it kind of like you know like balances out so if you could you know balance a blend like that of something that you knew like got really good in 15 years now you've now you've built a cake that like tastes good you know like through through the through the progression and so um, it's nice to try and um, we've we've certainly built some of those things into our blends. So you do think a little bit about uh, just how a tea will be in the future, at least. It is I something do. you it's, it's take into consideration. It's, it's definitely something. Yeah. It's definitely something that I take into consideration. Whether 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 my blends will do good or not. I mean, I certainly I certainly hope they right. will. And, and I think in a large in, in a large majority of them, they'll they'll do fine. Uh huh. Okay. And I guess that would sort of be like leaning a little bit more towards like stronger tea. Um, it, um, like when you're thinking about sort of like the future, yeah, and I mean, it, like it, it depends. And, you know, for every single one of our, our, our teas, like I, I try to, unless it's, you know, like one blend from one year to the next where I try to like get it to match as close as possible. I really want each of our teas to be, uh, a unique experience. I want them, I don't want people to be able to say like all those teas taste exactly the same. And so we certainly have a, a variety of flavor and aroma experiences and, uh, I've got some customers that swear by this tea and then other customers that are like, yeah, I did that one didn't do anything for me. And then <laughs> it, like the flip side of the coin. So some things, sometimes it's about just kind of having something for every, every customer. Um, yeah. Okay. So, uh, one thing, uh, most people in sort of our Western tea circle yep. don't really travel or go to Yunnan or any of like the tea spots in Asia. Like I'd say the average person probably does not. Uh, so you and Lamu make that trip yearly. Uh, Every year, yep. Yep. And in the past, you've told me that certain teas you've stocked are well-liked by Westerners, but not necessarily by uh, Yunnan-based tea drinkers, whether yeah. it's the Kunming people or, or the farmers. Um, so I've had other vendors tell me that there's like a pretty significant difference in uh, the Western taste versus like taste that they actually prefer yeah. um, at like regions, whether it's oolongs or, or whatever. Um, so are there certain tea types or profiles that of tea that Westerners tend to like specifically? Um, it's a good, it's a good question. And I, I mean, I, I was surprised when I went, I went to Yunnan, um, by how few people in Yunnan actually drink Puer. Uh, it was, it was, that was, that was my biggest surprise. Nearly every single like a home that we went to would, would have cakes of puer, but they were primarily, uh, it was just, just, just Longjing, just Longjing grandpa style is nearly just, just simple green teas, grandpa style. Every single restaurant you go to is going to be, uh, uh grandpa style. And so that was definitely a, that was definitely a surprise. So, um, and I guess like we spend so much of our time working with puer tea professionals that I think it maybe skews a little bit of what like Yunnan drinks, right? So when I talk about like what Pu'er professionals really want to do um, or really want to drink, um, these are people that have been in the industry for probably their whole lives. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, like any, any industry, like you get, you get desensitized to, to experiences and you want like that bigger experience, which I think is why people in, in, in Yunnan, in the, in the Pu'er tea industry start to eventually 
progress towards only wanting to drinking like strong, aggressive, like Shang Pu's because those are the only ones that really still have the ability for them to you know, like experience something, you know, like something, something strong. And I've certainly noticed that with my flavor profile. Um, uh, I, there's definitely a difference between, um, you know, like Simao or Lin Song or, or Zishuang Bana. Um, you know, we had one tea vendor tell me that like Lin Song, Lin Song teas are a young man's game. And it took me a long time to really kind of figure out what that meant. And I think what he meant was like, there's good teas in Lin Song, but like, it just takes a lot more work to actually find them. Mm. You know, the mountains are further apart and you know, like maybe the production quality is not as good. Whereas, you know, like if you're, if you're a tea vendor and a tea sourcer and you go to Meng Hai for a month, you could spend every single day driving to a different mountain that's 30 minutes away and find amazing teas at those mountains. It's really, it's, I don't mean to say it's, it's low effort, but like the, the, the concentration Closer, of yeah. really high quality pu'er to like the Meng Hai, you know, Zishuang Bana, Bulong area is, uh, is, is, is huge. And so I think they tend to progress towards those teas because it's a little bit uh, easier to find a uh, higher quality, higher quality examples. And then I think it's kind of, I don't know, cart follows the horse thing. You know, it's just like, those are what, you know, if, if, if those are what the vendors are sourcing, that's what the industry is saying is, you know, like the good quality teas. But there's, um, I mean, quality tea is quality tea. You know, like if, uh, you know, like there's some really amazing, really amazing teas, you know, like uh, in Lean Song and, you know, like Simao. Like I, I love, I love Kunlu Shan. I like, um, um, you know, teas from like, uh, uh, like Bangdong or the Shigwe area and stuff. I guess Shigwe's got a pretty, pretty big name, but um um, and do you, so do you find that Westerners are maybe like a little more open towards like, I guess if like the t- yeah. tea professional consensus trends towards sort of Shishuang Bana, Meng Hai area teas or whatever, or Iwu, uh, then do you find that like maybe the Western audience might be a little more open towards like Min Song or Simao? I think, I think, I think, at, I think at the high end, um, Western Pu'er tea drinkers follow uh, the, the high-end Bulong Zishuang Bana experience. But, you know, like the, the experiences that those offer are so, so concentrated and potent. And the majority of new tea drinkers in the West are, their palates are young and that it's, 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 it's a lot, it's a lot to process. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're really amazing teas, you know, like something, you know, like a nice Laumana, which has like a really strong, aggressive bitterness. And then it's, it's, it's perfectly balanced into this sweetness. It just like melts down the back of your throat, but it's hard for people to actually like work, work through that tea because like they just taste bitter and they're done. I see. Um, Interesting. So it almost sounds like, uh, the more, the, a lot of the more experienced tea drinkers in the West also prefer similar Meng Hai sort of teas. But, yeah. you know, when you're looking at more of like someone that's just getting into pour for maybe the first year or something, yeah. they might, Meng Hai teas may actually not be the best teas for them because yeah. they are like, they're really focused on like potency, the strength, the aftertaste, like the sweetness really isn't necessarily very obvious. I think that's um, why um, I think that's why like like Jing Mai has such a really nice following in hmm. the West is because Jing Mai experiences are just they're 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 super floral they're just like they're 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 full bodied but they just don't have a lot of those like I mean there are bitter and aggressive teas from from Jing Mai but primarily like the Jing Mai experience is like you know like honey aromas like florals just really really good smelling teas that are uh, are sweet so I think they're popular as for people new to Pu'er. Okay, that makes sense. Um, okay. Well, I guess, uh, the last question is a simple one. So every year it seems like you do some old favorites and you release a few new teas. Yeah. Uh, what should people expect for 2019? Um, you know, probably more of the same. Like I, I really want to focus on, I mean, that one of the reasons that we, that we go there and spend so much time there is just ensuring quality, like ensuring quality of production, ensuring quality of, you know, transportation collection, ensuring quality of, you know, like pressing and wrapping in, in, in storage. Um, I found like if I'm, if I'm not there, um, even when we're communicating what we want to people, sometimes those things just aren't done. So right. the best way for me to ensure quality is to actually be there. So, um, I want to get to new mountains that I haven't been to before. I'd like to spend more, uh, more time digging through uh, digging through Iwu. I really like the I really like the Iwu area. Um, there's some um, um, 
Yeah, so uh, we're also trying to work with new uh, new artists, uh, new Seattle artists, and new uh, new Kunming Yunnan artists. Uh, get some really fun designs on our on our cakes. I, I love the fact that like a, a cake of uh, like the wrapper on a cake of tea can be art in and of itself. I really liked I really like focusing on that. So people are going to see uh, new artists that we're working with this year. And um, and you have some new premium ripe coming soon. We do. Really, really excited about that. Maybe by the time this video is out, we'll have some really nice uh, high-end uh, old tree Lao Banjong Shopur on our site, which is super excited. We've been following this progression of Shopur being able to handle more high-end leaf production, and I'm really excited to be able to offer some of those, but they're, they're just uh, they're, 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 they're not cheap. It's, yeah. I wish it was, but it's not. Okay, well, great. Uh, so thank you, Glenn, for yeah. appearing on this video. Um, it was fun, man. Yeah, it was. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and I think that just about finishes us up. So uh, cheers, everyone, and great. we'll see you next time. Thanks.